APCO Basic Science Video Menopause Women are considered menopausal after 12 months of amenorrhea and reflects the depletion of ovarian follicles. The median age for natural menopause is 51.4 years. The transition from a woman's reproductive years to menopause is perimenopause and is also known as the menopausal transition. This occurs on average about four years prior to the final menstrual period. During perimenopause and menopause, there are significant changes that can impact a woman's life. The objectives of this video are to understand the physiologic changes in estrogen levels and the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access in perimenopause and menopause, describe the pathophysiology of symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, and discuss treatment options for the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. To review the clinical manifestations and management of menopause, please see the APCO educational topic number 47 on menopause. Let's meet our patient. Miss Menopause is a 49-year-old who presents with irregular periods and hot flashes. She sometimes skips her period. Bleeding is variable and longer, which is consistent with anovulatory cycles. As part of your workup, no specific cause for her irregular bleeding is identified, including an endometrial biopsy that demonstrates proliferative endometrium. She asks if her symptoms mean that she is close to menopause. Before you answer her question, let's review the physiologic changes that occur in perimenopause and menopause. Remember that in reproductive aged women, the hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian access is responsible for normal menstrual cycles. The hypothalamus produces GnRH, which stimulates the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary produces LH and FSH, which stimulates the ovarian follicles to produce estrogen and inhibin. Increasing levels of estrogen and inhibin cause negative feedback to both the hypothalamus as well as the anterior pituitary. So what happens in perimenopause? There is reduced ability of aging follicles to secrete inhibin, which is produced in granulosa cells of developing follicles. This decrease in inhibin decreases negative feedback to the anterior pituitary, resulting in an increase in FSH. This drives the ovarian follicular response, and estrogen levels are maintained. Menstrual cycles can remain ovulatory, but the follicular phase, or the first half of the cycle prior to ovulation, tends to shorten. As women progress towards menopause, there is an increase in anovulatory cycles, accounting for most cases of abnormal uterine bleeding. However, it is important to remember that this age group is also at increasing risk for developing endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma, especially given increased unopposed estrogen levels from anovulation. With menopause, ovarian follicles undergo accelerated loss until there is a depletion of follicles. Remember, at birth, women typically have about 1 million follicles. This number rapidly decreases after birth and continues to decline, with a steep decline in the mid to late 30s. At menopause, there are only a few hundred follicles remaining. With depletion of follicles, there is diminished estrogen production. This decreases negative feedback, which increases GnRH release, causing high circulating FSH and LH levels. As we will see later, these hormonal changes can have significant impact on women. Let's go back to our patient. You discuss with our patient that given her age and negative workup, she is likely perimenopausal. You review with her that hot flashes or vasomotor symptoms are common, occurring in up to 80% of women. They typically last one to five minutes and are described as a sudden wave of heat that spreads over the body, particularly the upper body and face. They are associated with sweating, palpitations, anxiety, and sleep disturbances. So what causes hot flashes is likely secondary to dysfunction of the thermoregulatory nucleus of the hypothalamus. The thermoregulatory nucleus regulates sweating and vasodilatation. With higher temperatures, the nucleus activates the heat dissipation mechanisms and there's increased sweating and vasodilatation to cool down the body. This maintains the core body temperature in a normal regulated range, also known as the thermoregulatory zone. In this diagram, the core body temperature is on the y-axis. The temperature between the two pink lines is the thermoregulatory zone. For women with severe hot flashes, it is hypothesized that they have a narrower thermoregulatory zone. This means minimal changes in core body temperature can induce a hot flash. Let's pause, read, and apply. How does a drop in estrogen change the thermoregulatory zone to increase hot flashes? It is hypothesized that a drop in estrogen increases neurotransmitter concentrations in the hypothalamus, which creates a narrower thermoregulatory zone. 
In particular, norepinephrine and serotonin have been shown to lower the thermal regulatory set point, triggering heat loss mechanisms more easily. It is important to note that this is secondary to estrogen withdrawal or rapid fluctuations in levels rather than chronically low estrogen levels. Your patient asks what else she can expect with menopause. You discuss with her some important changes that occur with menopause. You first discuss with her the risk of bone loss, especially during the first 10 years after menopause. Why does this happen? Recall that in normal bone remodeling, there is a constant resorption of bone carried out by the osteoclasts. At the same time, there is bone formation by osteoblasts. Osteoblasts produce the proteins RANK-L and OPG. RANK-L binds to RANK, a receptor on the surface of osteoclast progenitor cells, which promotes the development of osteoclasts and leads to bone resorption. OPG binds to RANK-L, which prevents it from binding with RANK. This mechanism decreases osteoclast development. In menopause, there is lower estrogen. Rank L production outnumbers OPG. Therefore, osteoclast development and bone resorption is favored, with ongoing bone loss over time. From a cardiovascular standpoint, decreased estrogen can affect the lipid profile, with increased LDL cholesterol increasing the risk for cardiovascular disease. Vulvovaginal atrophy is a common complaint in menopause, including symptoms of dryness, itching, and dyspareunia. This is caused by decreased estrogen resulting in thinning of the vaginal epithelium and loss of vaginal collagen and adipose tissue. Loss of sebaceous glands on the vulva contributes to dryness. The vulva is also affected with narrowing of the vaginal introitus. Similarly, Thinning of the epithelium of the lower urinary tract, including the bladder and urethra, increased risk of incontinence and can contribute to recurrent UTIs. Some women may also have mood disturbances with an increased risk of new onset depression in the menopausal transition. This is unclear if it is secondary to a decrease in estrogen or if it is a result of menopausal symptoms such as hot flashes, night sweats, and or sleep disturbances. The patient would like to know what are some options for treatment. You discuss with her that menopausal hormone therapy, or MHT, is the most efficacious treatment for hot flashes, with a 75% reduction in frequency and severity of hot flashes. Hormonal therapy can also improve fracture rates. The goal of menopausal hormone therapy is to be on the minimal dose for the shortest amount of time possible, given increased risks associated with its use. For healthy women in their 50s, the overall risk of complications is low. Let's pause, read, and apply. Why do women taking menopausal hormone therapy with an intact uterus need progestin therapy in addition to estrogen therapy? For women with an intact uterus, progestin therapy must be added to prevent endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. For women receiving estrogen and progestins, there is an increased risk for breast cancer, stroke, cardiovascular events, and venous thromboembolism. For women without a uterus and only receiving estrogen, there is no increased risk of breast cancer or cardiovascular events but there is an increased risk of stroke and venous thromboembolism. Please review the APCO educational topic number 47 on menopause to review the Women's Health Initiative trial. Alternatives to menopausal hormone therapy for hot flashes include gabapentin, clonidine, and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. The mechanism of action for gabapentin is unknown. For clonidine, remember that it is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. It decreases sympathetic outflow by inhibiting the release of norepinephrine. With decreased norepinephrine, the thermal regulatory set point returns closer to normal, illustrated here as the top pink line, causing a decrease in hot flashes. Similarly, SSRI and SNRIs decrease the uptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. Similar to what happens with clonidine, a decrease in both these neurotransmitters causes the thermal regulatory set point to return closer to normal, decreasing hot flashes. These medications improve hot flashes by 50 to 62 percent. Herbal medications such as black cohosh and phytoestrogen such as soy have inconsistent evidence of efficacy. Finally, vaginal estrogen is an option for women with vulvovaginal or urinary symptoms. Estrogen is used locally with minimal systemic absorption and improves urogenital symptoms. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on menopause. We have covered the physiologic and pathologic changes in perimenopause and menopause, and treatment options for the symptoms of menopause.